Let us know um, if you are a parent, if you're a student of On Track, um, maybe you are not from Moto, maybe you're from a different sport, and that will give us an idea. Let us know um, if you are a parent, if you're uh -oh. a student of On Track, um, maybe. Okay, we'll try that again. Oh my gosh, we've got somebody from Australia. How exciting is that? Texas. So again, I think we had a little background noise. Go ahead and let us know who you are in the chat. Let us know if you're a parent, if you're a student, maybe you're a learning coach at On Track, maybe you're an athletic coach, um, maybe you're not from Moto, maybe you do BMX, NASCAR, maybe you swim, play baseball, whatever it is. You are welcome, more than welcome to be here with our team. And we're really excited to have you. And that will let us know who our audience is. And it'll let Jason know as well. So we've got South Carolina, we've got Florida, and on track learning coach Kylie and her son Brighton. Hi, guys. We've got a staff member at on track school that lives in Georgia. Fantastic. California motocross student. California, my old backyard. Nice, nice to have a Californian with us. A student from Massachusetts. Well, that's exciting because our presenter is from Massachusetts. We also have Tennessee. All right, Coach Danny's here. Montana, New Mexico. I'm sure you guys could read, but I get very excited. So I have to, I have to say this out loud. We've got Texas. Hmm. And like I said, Australia. I think we're covering a lot of the globe here today. That's very exciting. Excellent. Very good. A moto parent, grandparent, and staff member from Florida, my new state. Hello to Teresa Berry. Welcome. Okay, and we're going to get started in just a second with our best practices. Um, but just so you know, it's really important to keep your, your mic on mute. It helps to navigate the background noise so that we can hear our presenter. Um, and it's awesome to get to know where you guys are from. All right. And I think we have some best practice slides coming up here shortly. We'll see, but I know you guys know our best practices, but we're gonna review them just in case. Hang on tight. Tasha, do we have those coming up? Tasha, you are on mute. Um, I, yeah, can you, you can't see it? I don't see it, no. Is okay, it up? It says I've started, we've started screen sharing, but I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay. Hold on, give me one second. Sure, no problem. So if you haven't gone ahead and put in the chat where you're from, you can go ahead and do that. Let us know if you're a parent, student, on track student, maybe you train with our presenter. Maybe you ride two wheels or four wheels. We'd love to hear about it. And it's always fun to have some cameras on and see some smiling faces. I see some, uh, on track students here today, I see Bentley. Hey, Bentley, how you doing? All right, here we go. So again, welcome to our April On Track School Presents. And we want you to have the best possible experience for our um, webinar today. So we'll go to the next slide. 
And so here are your tips. You wanna make sure that your mic is on mute so that we can keep the background noise to a minimum. You can definitely use the chat box during our presentation and make sure that, that your box says to everybody and not just to one person so that we can all read your question later on during our, our presentation. And then you will be asked to unmute your mic. If you wanna ask your question, you can. If you rather type it in and have us read it, we can do that for you too. And then finally in the top right um, hand, side of your screen there's a little button that says view and you can either view in gallery mode or speaker mode so that's another little feature that you can use so we'll get started um, i do want to say that on track school presents um, i believe is in its fourth year you can go to our website at ontrackschool.com and you can see all the different presenters that we've had and honestly learn some life lessons. And that's what this is all about. This is something that was a dream of mine to be able to share other people's passions, other people's challenges, so that you can find your passion, find what fuels you, learn from other people's experience, I think is, is a really important tool. So we're just really grateful. Um, that Jason Beller has decided to make time for our program today. But before we get started, this would not be possible if I didn't take a moment to thank the on track team. So I'd like to thank Tasha Renfro, our operations director. She's behind the scenes. She's streaming us to YouTube. She's taking care of all the behind the scenes things and keeping our team together. I'd like to thank London Kane. She's working in our HR department and alongside Tasha. And I'd also like to thank Allie Lieb, um, my daughter, who's come on board to help us promote events like this. So thank you, Team on Track. And without further ado, I would love to uh, introduce Jason Fowler. Uh, Jason Fowler, I love his, his role. His passion is to help humans reach their full potential, a potential coach. And for those of you who might not know, because I know we've got some younger ones in the audience tonight, Potential means maximize your ability to do whatever it is that you want to do and believe that you can do it. And so I'm I'm a like minded person like Jason, and I'm very honored to have the privilege to meet him and and have you hear his story tonight. So, Jason, welcome to the on track presents for April and taking the time to meet our our family, our on track family. Hello, all. Thank you. Andrew. I I appreciate the introduction. I'm super excited to be with you guys. I have so much to share. I could probably talk for hours, although I, I may put you to sleep after like the first hour. Um, but um, again, we have, we have got a lot to share. And um, I was once, I think, in your exact shoes um, as a kid and whether it's a motor world or what it is, but I was a, grew up a motocross racer and um, um, had an accident when I was 17 years old. And, and, um, and what I learned after having my accident that stopped me from being able to ever race motorcycles again was that it wasn't really about what I was doing, what sport I was in. And so, um, but, but really how I did it. And, um, and so specifically I got into wheelchair racing after that and did 10 years of marathons and competed 30 marathons in I guess eight years and then got into Ironman triathlons. And now since I've done over, shoot, over 45 marathons 50 something triathlons now i've been to the world championships seven times and i've won two world titles um in the ironman distance and one in the half ironman distance and um and so i've been competing for about 45 years so i, I tell you that not to impress you but to kind of tell you from the place that i've come through um in motocross in that world i won eight new england championships i was second loretta's my last year and i won all my classes at gainesville at the mini olympics um before my injury and so I was on this place to go and thinking, wow, I'm on top of the world. And then I wasn't. And what I figured out over time was that it was really my mindset that that made the difference. And so that's really why I'm here to share what I have to share. Um, we're going to start with just a quick video that's about four minutes that tells a little bit more about my story and puts us in the right frame of mind. So I'm going to share that with you guys. Let's see Excellent. here. And so give me a thumbs up if you can hear the sound in a moment.
was 17, had an accident on my motocross bike and was out practicing. Hit a rock and some grass and it sent me flying. I landed straight down on my head and instantaneously lost feeling. Being in the hospital and all of a sudden the physician comes in. We've got good news, we've got bad news. The bad news is you're never gonna walk again. The good news is people with your circumstances, they lead normal active lives. And I'm thinking, what does that mean? The first time I got in a racing wheelchair, it was the first time that I felt free. It was the first time that I forgot about my accident. I forgot about the previous six months where heartache and crying and I won't say depression, but just a really challenging time. And for me, jumping in a racing wheelchair, the first time was just blissful. Racing was the one thing that allowed me to forget about my accident, forget about what I couldn't do and focus on what I could do. And um, I was a horrible wheelchair racer to start. I mean, a horrible. For me, that was a, an amazing and huge challenge to sort of overcome and to tackle. And it made me forget everything that I didn't have and got me excited about life again. I've been to five Ironman World Championships and what keeps me going and what keeps me continuing to push is that every year and every cycle of training is different for me. So it, it means something different. And I'm a different person every time that I do it. When I first started triathlon, all I wanted to do was win. All I wanted to do is qualify for the World Championships and win the World Championship. And then slowly over time, I, I won. I went through a lot of challenge, but I won. And then I got to winning and really felt empty felt like, is this all that it's all about? And then did a lot of self-work and self-discovery to find that there's a lot more underlying why I was doing triathlon and, and what that was all about. And really allowed me to find myself in a way that guided me on life's journey in a unique way. Everybody in life is gonna have challenges and it's really how you look at those challenges that either makes or breaks your life. And all of our experiences and all of our lives are just a collection of experiences. And so if you can look at it in a positive light, it's just so much more powerful. So I, I quit my corporate job after 16 years and decided to start coaching. And I think really, uh, for me, it was a calling, a calling that I knew I always wanted to help others and share what I've learned starting as a teenager and having coaches and people that challenge me and push me outside my comfort zone. A lot of us are in this middle zone of, of never really achieving and never really failing. And I want more people to achieve and I want more people to fail. And I feel like we're all here and we all have gifts to give. And I think just being open to failing and achieving just makes us feel alive and I want more people to feel that in their lives. Wow, what a what a video, Jason. That's just amazing. Very well done. What a story. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so um for you guys that don't know about Ironman triathlons, um, just to kind of give you a little background on the com the competitions that I race. So Ironman's are 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, which you saw I use a hand cycle, and a 26.2 mile marathon, which I use a racing wheelchair. So uh, it takes the winners about eight hours, eight and a half hours, and it normally takes me about 11 hours. And um, and so you can imagine how do you not only prepare for a race physically um, that's 11 hours in length, but how do you mentally prepare so that um, I can tell you during that 11 hour race, um, the most common thought is, what am I doing out here? And I want to quit. 
and I've I've found ways to 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 really get the best for myself during that race. Not only my preparation, which um, I do long bike rides and do do that stuff physically, but really it's the mental part of how do I get my mind strong so that no matter what I don't quit, and that I keep giving it everything I have during the entire competition. And and that is not any small feat when when you don't feel like it. You know, I'm sure you guys have woken up in the in the morning and you're like. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to get up or I don't want to go practice. And for me, it was those days. And I learned over a period of time, there was those days that I got up and did it when I didn't feel like it, they got it. And it, and the other thing that I learned through that process was that it really was um, making it fun, making it enjoyable and, and enjoying that process and not focusing so much on what place I got, but really enjoying it. And then the result of that was that I did my best which was awesome is when I'm relaxed and I'm focused and I'm just there having fun. Then my, my best came out. So anyways, that's, that's, um, about the Ironman, but I guess we could, we could bring the slides up now if that, that works. Awesome. Perfect. So first slide, um, we'll go to the first one. Um, this is sort of our roadmap for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to introduce you guys to what that means. And I've kind of already started that process. I'm going to kind of tell you guys what some secrets are of world champions and and some of our heroes, both in the moto sports and moto world and in other sports as well, because really um, you'll learn that it doesn't matter if it's in life or if it's with athletics and it doesn't matter the sport. It's really all the same concepts and strategies that we used to be our best. Um, and then the third and fourth thing that we're going to talk about is is sort of a, um, some big concepts in mental training that are really the, the things that move us forward um, the most. And I know a lot of you guys struggle with it and a lot of you guys are really good at it as well. And um, and so we'll talk about how how we optimize our focus and concentration so that we don't we, we do our best. And then also, how do we build our self-confidence? And we know that when we're confident and we're relaxed and we're having fun, that's usually when we perform our best. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what is mental performance? And I already had mentioned this. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. And what I mean and what that means is um, it doesn't matter the sport. It doesn't matter if you're um, in any sport for that matter, right? And so if you're out riding your bike, you could say um, you're out riding your bike, um, your bicycle, just even say your, your pedal bicycle. Um, now there's a difference in how you do that, right? You can give it 110% effort and sprint and do your very best in say a, a bicycle race, or you just go out there and, and just kind of do your thing. Or, you know, when you go out and practice and, and you're trying really hard, or um, if you're doing your schoolwork and you're doing just enough to get by, right? And, and sometimes we're just not motivated or sometimes we just don't feel like it. Well, the mental component of that is how do we strain, train our mind so that we're stronger and that we want to do these things. And that doesn't mean we don't do hard things or that we do only just easy things, but it's it's how we approach it. It's the attitude we take when we approach that. It's the underlying intent that we have. So we're saying like, okay, I'm going to go to school today or I'm going to go practice and I'm giving it everything I have. I don't care what you're doing, but I'm giving everything I have. And, and when you do that, that's when you get the best from yourself. And that doesn't mean you don't have fun, that you're not enjoying the process. And so when you're when you really figure that out, um, really good things start to happen. Okay, so what what is it not? So we used to think that mental performance was just sort of rainbows and butterflies. And now all the science and all the scientists and researchers have proven that, that really it's how we think about things that has the most influence over it. So um, I want you guys to put in, in the chat box down below, what percent you think your performance and outcome is dictated by your mental your mental game. And so, and we'll put that in other words, um, if your physical skill accounts for 50%, then maybe your mental accounts for another 50%. Or do you believe that the mental game is 90% and the physical part is only 10%? I want you guys to put in the chat room below, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit or actually at the end. And so, um, yeah, I think that's it'd be interesting to see where you guys are at with that. And then and then I'm curious to see at the very end if I've changed your mind as to as to what that percent is. OK, and so the other thing is, is what is mental performance? Well, it's the reason why 
all the greats are the greats. So if you think about your favorite rider, racer, athlete, person in life, it doesn't have to be an athlete. It could just be somebody that's amazing at what they do. If you think and you really get down to the lowest level of detail that describes who they are and how they do it and, and why they do it and what they look like. So maybe Michael Jordan, maybe Eli Tomac or Cooper Webb right now that's going for the Supercross Championship or um, um, Plessinger or the 250 riders, the, the Lawrence brothers, right? Like what makes them so great at what they do? And if you think about that, it's what we call the intangibles. It's the things that you can't measure. And so we're going to go into detail on, on some of what those things are. Um, but those are, that's the reason why uh, we train the mental performance game. And what we've learned is that when you don't train the mental performance game, you're really leaving it to chance. You're leaving it to your experience and you're you're leaving a little bit on the table as to, to be your best, not only be your best and perform well, but to really enjoy the process. And this is, is not all science. It's more of an art than a science, meaning you can get to be creative with it. Some guys go to the races and they're chill and, and cool as a cucumber and others are uptight and nervous. And so we're going to go through some, some strategies on, on how to be your best in, re, in regards to your nerves and, and how you control those. And, 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 and again, that doesn't have to be with sports and athletics. It could just be, I'm really nervous before an exam, or I'm really nervous to go talk to these new people and in relationships. So it, it really relates to everything in life. I want you guys to know. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is the introduction. And, and basically, um, I want to start by saying, uh, we know that some riders, racers, athletes have natural ability. They're really good at their sport and they don't really have to practice very much. And what we've learned over time is that as you age and as you go up, you'll notice, and probably some of you guys have already had this experience as you go up in class and you get better. Um, what we find is that everybody around you gets really good too. And all of a sudden, everybody starts catching up with the other person. Now, I know if I was, for me at least, I want to be the guy that that is mentally tough and, and has to work really hard and knows how to work hard. And the reason for that is, and we'll, we're going to talk about this, is um, I find that no matter what, there's a system and there's a way that you figure it out. So a way that you approach something to make you really good at it. And that doesn't matter if it's school. If it's how to ride a turn track really fast, how to ride a bike really good, how to swim really good, no matter what you're trying to accomplish, um, there's a system that, in which you approach it. And the goal for that system is how do we learn and how do we learn really fast so that we get good fast, so that we get to enjoy it more? Um, I, would agree, I would say that we definitely enjoy things when we're doing it really well. But, but the interesting part is, um, when you're just starting out or you're a novice, or even if you're an amateur, um, we're not very good at some of those things. So we have to be able to get through those really hard things. And that's where the mental and the mindset comes in, um, to not give up and how do you be resilient? And so the first thing we're going to talk about is the mental flexibility. I think this is the most important thing. I call it cognitive flexibility, mental flexibility, and really it's your mind being able to adapt to any situation. See, if you can imagine, um, you, you go to the racetrack and yes, you're going there to race. Um, a lot of you guys are going there to win, right? But at the same time, we have to have the flexibility to be like, I'm actually going there to really have fun. Because you can imagine if you're going to the races and you're not having fun, then that is a problem. Because over a short period of time, we deal with burnout. And burnout, usually the first sign of that is like, I don't really feel like doing it. You start losing motivation. And, and that's where, because we put too much pressure on ourselves, we put too high of expectations on the outcome and we forgot about the process, right? And so being flexible with our thoughts and being open-minded to say like, yes, I can go to the racetrack and be relaxed and chill. But when I put my helmet on, it's game time. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to give it 110%. And I'm going to focus on what I have to do to execute. And then at the end of the day, when you load up the bikes and your gear and you drive away, you feel good regardless of the place you got because you gave it 110% effort. And I feel like that that is the win. What happens is if you find that you're getting too nervous before competitions, what I find is that the expectations are too high and you're putting too much pressure on yourselves. 
And again, that doesn't mean you don't want to win. That doesn't mean that that you won't win. It just means that that backing off a little bit and saying like, hey, my best actually means that I am just more relaxed and having fun at the races. And that's how I get the best. Um, so that's that's the mental flexibility component. So the, the second piece is confidence in which we're going to talk about in depth at the end. But confidence, you can imagine if you're not sure of yourself and you don't believe that you can do it or that if you're waiting to get a result to feel confident, then we know we're not mentally as strong as we could be. Most people always wait to say like, oh, I just want to get a great result before I'm confident. Or, you, or we even hear the pros. I've heard Cooper Webb. I've heard Eli Tomac. Well, I'm just not, or I'm feeling really confident. Everything's flowing. I'm feeling really good. And then other times, even as a professional that have been racing for 20 plus years and are at the best, some of the best in the world, and they're like, I'm just not as confident as I was. I'm not as sharp as I was. So just know it's something that we all struggle with at different times, no matter who we are and how good we are at something. But it's also something that we can train. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we do that and where that is comes from. So we'll talk about that last, actually. The third thing is we're going to talk about resiliency right now. And that is when you fall, do you get back up? Or when you're not feeling like it, doing something that you do it anyways, you're resilient and that you can, you have the mental aptitude to, to persevere through really hard things. And that may mean just mean trying to do hard things that you don't back down when things are really hard or that um now if i if i challenge you to say um you had four choices to do um a run okay the first choice was you were going to do one mile the second choice was you're going to do five miles the third choice is you're going to do 10 miles and the fourth choice is you're going to do a full marathon 26.2 miles now, give me a thumbs up if you're going to take the first option as, as a challenge. Give me a second. Give me a thumbs up if you're going to do the second option as five miles. And the third for 10 or the fourth for 26. Now, so for me, the way that I see that, and I've actually challenged some of my students before, Gage and Colton are on here, and they did. You know what? I forget exactly what they did, but um, let's just say they they biked, rode their they rode their motorcycles, they biked for like six hours in the rain, in the dark, and they challenged themselves. And the reason that I challenged them to that was um, is the mental part. When you run out of energy, and you're hungry, and you're tired, and you don't want to do it that's when you grow your mental muscle. And all of a sudden, because you just did it for five or six hours, or you did 26 miles or you did 10, all of a sudden, the next time you go to do anything that's even the slightest bit shorter, it feels easy. And all of a sudden you're going like, well, I can do that. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter the challenge you put in, in front of yourself. You're like, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I know that the outcome and how I wanna feel after is amazing. Okay, so the next the next thing I want to talk about was discipline. Discipline um, is a huge mental performance category because that's the thing that um, we know that to accomplish anything we want, whether it's our schoolwork or athletics, that we have to do it every day, that we have to practice as much as we can. If it's not every day, maybe it's every other day. You can imagine if you didn't do your schoolwork every day, like what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen to your grades? What's going to happen to your riding, racing, your athletics? So discipline's a huge deal. Now, we don't we don't do those things if we're not motivated to do it. So we have to know why we're doing it and where motivation comes from. So that's something that we train as well. And that's what we find is that when we focus on the process and we focus on why we did it in the first place, we love riding our bike, we love throwing a basketball, we love swimming, we love our car, whatever it is. When we focus on those things and the thing that we love to do, we're naturally more motivated. It's when we start focusing too much on the outcome and what place we want to get that we lose sight of why we're doing it in the first place and we burn out. And that's where, where a lot of people end up by the time they're 16 or 17 because they've been doing a sport for 10 years and, and they, they've done nothing but focus on that. So it, it's really an art and that's where a lot of people come to me 
for help. Uh, the next category is focus and concentration. We see this is one of the most important things, especially for motorsport athletes, because if you lose focus and concentration for just a split second, we could crash and get hurt. And, and that's always a possibility. So we, we know that that's a big one. And, and um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, in greater detail. The next is, is nerves, anxiety, and how we manage that process. Um, and that's a little bit more tricky, um, but there's techniques and strategies that we use to, to calm our nerves. And, and again, not too much, put not too much pressure on ourselves, um, to be our best and to perform our best. And there's ways that we can do that. The next is relationships and communication. Now that is with your friends, as you know, when you go somewhere and you know, you have a lot of friends there, whether it's at school, whether it's at the track or any of your athletics, when you have the most fun. When you have close friends, family, and the team that are around you, when you have that, and that's as a function of how you communicate, how nice you are, how you do good things, um, how nice of a person you are, and all those character traits that make people um, awesome people and make them want to be around you and you be around them, and it makes it makes the whole thing work. It makes it really to enjoy that process in such a way that um, you can imagine not having friends around, like that's not so much fun. So it's like, how do you be better at those relationships? So they have better, more meaningful and fun relationships to be your best. And that kind of really leaves into the last one of fulfillment, enjoyment and happiness. So, so again, if we're not training these things and we're not getting good, we're just leaving them the chance, just like anything else that we do to try to get good at, there's ways to train that. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so this one, I get super excited about because um, for me, um, in my journey to become a world championship, um, I had a lot more um, failure than I did success. And and I'll just tell you just a, a quick little story. And so I, I started training for Ironman, and um, you can imagine trying to twelve for, or train for a race that's 140 miles long and 11 hours in length. And so I spent six straight months training, training, training. And I went to the trials and I got to the Ironman World Championships and it's held in Hawaii every year. And I got to mile 106 and they pulled me off the course because I didn't make the time cutoff. And so I had just spent a year and a half, but six straight months of only training for this race. And I was devastated. And the first thing I thought was, oh boy, I got to go back there next year and and qualify at the trials again and get to the world championships and finish this race and prove to myself and everybody that I can do it. Well, I went to the trials the next year and I didn't qualify. So I went back to the drawing board and I started training even more. And I went back to the trials again the next year, except I went to two trials. I went to one in Europe and I went to one here in, in Texas. Actually, it's in West Texas, Lubbock. Some of you guys may know. And those races are brutally long. They're half Ironmans and they take about five or six hours. And that time I missed it um, by four minutes and two and a half minutes. And I still didn't qualify the second year in a row. So the third year, I go back to the trials and I train even harder. And I go to both the Texas one and the European qualifier and I don't qualify again. And this time I miss it by just under two minutes and just under a minute. And I'm thinking, what do I have to do to be my best? What do I have to do to qualify to get back to this race? And what lessons am I not learning these other years that I'm not qualifying? And so finally, I just decided, you know what? I'm not going to go just to qualify. I'm going to go to win this race. And what, what I found was just setting that goal to win is it elevated my performance and my expectations for myself as to how hard I was going to have to work every single day. And so I, I barely missed a workout for almost a year. And every, every workout I had, I focused on that process of enjoying it and, and, um, and giving it intensity for every single workout. And I got to the trials the next year and I won the trials and I went on that year to go to the world championships and I got second place. And so I, I tell you that because, um, what I learned through that process was my formula for success. I needed a plan of exactly not what I was going to do and how long I was going to train, but how I was going to approach it, what attitude that I was going to have. And it was just raising my 
attitude and my, what I call my vibration or my vibe in the sense of like how hard I was going to try and how much effort I was going to give to every workout and how much discipline I was going to have. And you can imagine of training for four straight years to go to a race that all of a sudden my discipline muscle got really high. My resiliency muscle after failing got really high. And I became really confident and believe in myself, no matter what someone put in front of me, that I could accomplish it. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing that I that I got from that process is I began to believe in myself at a level that gave me this like superhuman that I could accomplish anything. So when I crossed that finish line, even though I got second place and I really wanted to win, I felt so good that the way in which I approached it, meaning the way that I was able to overcome all these things. And along the way, you're going to hear just like I did when you're going after your goals is that they're going to say, well, you can't do this or no, you're not that good. And for me, I never believed any of that, right? It affects you. It's not always the best thing. And I tried to surround myself and with my friends that believed in me and supported me and not the opposite. And that made a huge difference in my life. Um, so, so when I say secrets of world champions, creating a formula for success, right? That would start with just having a goal and having a plan as to how you get there, believing in yourself, no matter what happens, even if you fail over and over, do you know that the only time you lose is when you quit? I totally believe that with everything I do. And again, that's a really hard thing to do because when we're losing or we're not performing to our expectations, sometimes that just doesn't feel good, right? But we have to believe in ourselves. We have to believe that we are not a function of exactly what place we get, but it's more we feel good because we gave it 100% effort. And I was giving it 100% effort. I just didn't even know what that looked like or what that should should look like as to what 100% effort means. So I started studying the greats. I started studying all the people ahead of me um, that had won world championships. And I learned a lot from that. So, and what I, another great big thing that I learned was we fall back on the level of our prepar preparation. And what I mean by that is when I got to the races, I felt so confident, especially that last year that I got second place. It's really not my last year. I'll, I have a lot more to share about that. But what I learned is that um, when I got to the race, I felt so much more confident because when I looked in the mirror, it's not what everybody else said to me. It was what I believed because I had gone through all those days where I didn't feel like training and I got up and I trained anyways and I trained harder every time. And again, you can approach this, your schoolwork this way. You can approach any of your athletics this way. And um, you feel better when you're prepared. Okay. So next, I ask the important questions. And this, I think, is really important is, is how you, what, level of self-awareness you have about your performance and who you are. So I, I studied my weaknesses. How can I get better at the things that I'm not doing? So my swim was not very good. My first Ironman race, um, I got 20 minutes into the race and I was so nervous that I got seasick and I stopped for, I don't know, six or seven minutes trying to puke in the middle of a, and get sick in the middle of an Ironman race. So I figured, I think I have to work on my nerves and my swim um, just level of comfort. Um, and that was my weakness. Now, my strengths was I feel like I could go all day and be really fast after 11 hours or five hours or six hours. So that was my strength. So you have to evaluate what your strengths are and really use those to your advantage in your sport and, and in life. And then I always thought like, how do I not only learn these things, but how do I learn the fast and how do I implement them? This is the thing that most people don't do. The hardest thing you'll find as a person is to change and to change the way that you see things. The first part of that process is being self-aware. So you know what's making you good and what's making you not as good and what's holding you back. And then how do you adjust and move forward and make changes to be better? And what I found is just doing small little things consistency is what makes a champion. So doing it every single day. And so for my Ironman training, I, I actually did the Ironman World Champions even up to last year. And the most important part of my training is that I train every single day, seven days a week. 
And not any one day is very long. There's one day that's really long. That's about four to six hours on my bike. But the other days are no more than an hour and a half of workouts during the day, which you can imagine an hour and a half to train for an 11 hour race isn't too much. And my, my shortest day is only about 25 minutes, which is really easy. And it just kind of keeps the blood flowing. So anyways, consistency was one of the big things that, that helped me in, in my process. And lastly, we don't do it alone. Our family, our friends, our mechanics, our coaches, and our mentors, if we're not relying on them, then it doesn't, it takes longer, right? Plus it's so much more fun when we're doing it as a team. And so knowing and creating your team of people around you that are helping you be your best is super important. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay. All right. So we've kind of already talked about a little bit about this, but how do we train our mindset? Um, let's first, we again, we've already kind of talked about this, but being aware of it, being open that we can improve. And the second part is studying and implement it. Like we just said, it's really hard to change, but when we have goals, we have goals that we want to accomplish. Um, and these other categories, the steps of state change mobilization. We're not going to go into the detail there because again, I could talk for two hours and I may go a little long here, guys. Um, but um, because I get excited about about this material, maybe not as much as you guys, but um you will at some point. I I I promise you. Um and step three is is the habits. Again, it's the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that help train our mindset. Um, but these are just the goal setting, the state changes. How do we change, become nervous to not nervous within seconds? How do we visualize our best performance before a race so that we get the best from ourselves? The effort that we give, there's ways in which we practice that. If we give 100% effort in our schoolwork or our training is how we give 100% effort on the weekend. I say I have this, the best quote, it's one of my favorite quotes, is how we do anything is how we do everything. And so again, if we're working really hard and we're, we're, we're say we're scared to do things and we're we're approaching things that are scary to us, during the week, then on the weekend, we're going to be really good at approaching things that are scary and, and fearful about. So it's, again, how we do anything is how we do everything. And, and lastly, the consistency part is, the, uh, is really the glue that keeps it all together. Um, we can't expect to notice any train, any, and some of my students will, will attest to this. If you don't practice the mindset and maybe they haven't, or maybe they have, uh, you'd have to ask them, but, um, it's really when you do that work is when we see that and you do it consistently is when we see the outcomes um, are amazing. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Now the focus and concentration, we can really get in the weeds here. Um, but the the one thing that I wanted to tell you guys about this, there's actually two we'll, we're going to go through. We're going to go through number two and number four. So the first is how do we reduce our nerves and anxiety before a race or a competition or in general, right? And, and first, I'll back up even before that. Um, you guys know in athletics where uh, you've been in a race or a competition and it just feels effortless. It feels like nothing can get in your way. You're just in what you call the zone, right? Or this flow state, right? Give me a thumbs up if you guys have heard or seen that or felt that effortless feeling where it just goes amazing, right? see a lot of thumbs up, right? That's amazing. So what we know about that state is that you're in a certain brain wave. So not to get again in the weeds of the science, but there's certain brain waves, right? And we're in this place where all of a sudden, um, so that there's a, a brain wave. And if you're not in that state of in the zone or that keeps us out of there is nerves and anxiety, right? And so how do we reduce that, right? First is keeping expectations lower, right? More focusing on exactly what we have to do in the moment, right? So if, say, so for instance, for you motocross guys and gals, um, you get to the starting line, right? Okay, what do we have to do to have a good race? Well, we've got to get a good start. Okay, well, that doesn't really help entirely. What, what do we have to do to actually get a good start then? We got to get to the line and be calm and focused and relaxed. We got to be ready to go. We have to make sure our stuff is there. We have to um, know what gate we're going to choose, and we have to be know exactly how to execute a perfectly per, a perfect start for ourselves. Or 
how do we have to have a, a great race? Well, we got to think about exactly what we have to execute. So when we focus on exactly what we have to do in the moment, it then takes away the nervousness because you can only focus on one thing at a time, right? And then you have to practice it. You have to practice not being nervous and that that's a skill. So the next thing I want to talk about, and this is, it's really challenging for anybody that has never meditated, but it, we don't call it a meditation really because it, it really only takes one seventeen. So this, this is a science experiment. And what they said was that just one 17 minute period of time where you close your eyes and think about nothing. So if something comes into your mind, you stop thinking about it. Something else comes into your mind, you stop thinking about it. But you have to keep your eyes closed for 17 straight minutes, which I know a lot of you guys could do no problem at all. And some of you, maybe not so much, right? You'd be crawling out of your skin wanting to move. What we found is that what the, the experiment found is that it rewires your brain and you can focus so much better for that. And what's really cool is you only have to do it once to make this happen. So I thought that was really, really cool. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is a really big one. How do you build self-confidence, right? The first is you have to get really clear on what you want, right? And so, um, so for instance, having a goal on, on, so you go to the race day and you say, okay, my goal is, and my athletes will know this, or most of them will, the two goals that we always have is we're going to have fun and we're going to give 110%, right? And so right there, you know exactly what you have to focus on. Okay. Your goal is have fun, which, right. Is it art as well and a skill to have fun when maybe you're a little bit nervous? And giving 110% effort also um, is a skill. And so we focus on that and it, it takes away some of our nerves. And it also just builds the confidence uh, to know that we can do and we believe in ourselves to do uh, our best. The next is confidence really comes from when you get to the your competition or in general is when your preparation, it comes from your preparation, right? If you get to the race, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to ride because maybe I haven't practiced in three weeks or I just came off an injury and I'm just not, I'm a little unsure of myself. And so the confidence comes from practicing. And what's really cool when we learn from the mindset side of things is that um, we can practice in our minds. We can do that visualization. Um, the next is, when we do really hard things and we face our fears, that's where we also build confidence. And lastly is, is um, building confidence by mirroring those around us that have already showed us how to do it. So, right? So you look at your mentors, the people that you look up to, and he's like, how did they do it? And if they can do it, absolutely I can do it. It, it makes it possible when you look at theirs. And, and maybe you don't do it the exact same way that maybe your, your mentor or the people that you look up to but it gives you a, a, a glimpse into how you can. At the end of the day, the most important part is when you look in the mirror, because people may prop you up and say, oh, you, you can do it this weekend because you've beaten this person before, or you've done it before. At the end of the day, you have to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I believe in myself. I can do it because I've done the work and, and I really want this. And so you're the one where that confidence has to come from. And that's how we, we build a really strong foundation of confidence. Okay. Next slide, please. All right. Well, we made it. I think we went a little long, but I think we still have a little bit of time because we got a late start to do a Q and a, if you guys have questions. And I also, um, 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 I'm curious to look at the chat as to um, what people said as to the mindset, what percent they thought um, was mental. So it looks like we got a bunch here and um, I'll let Andrea chime in as well. She probably looked at the chat. Yeah, absolutely. I love the slides. They were, they were fantastic. You should see I'm a note taker. So <laughs> we always write down certain quotes that we want to, you know, remember your presentation with. So those were those were great. Um, I'm a lifelong learner. So I hope everybody out there is taking notes and learning too. 
Um, we, we've heard everywhere from 100%, because if you're not in it mentally, nothing else. Will, there's 85%, 80%, 90%, 40% mental, 60% physical, 65% mental, 80% mental, 45%, 70 or 80 40% physical, 60% mental, and one person said 25% mental. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, I challenge you to sort of compare that to what you thought before um, versus now and, and what you learned um, and how, again, we, we we put our minds to something that we can accomplish anything that we set our minds to. And um, that's a super powerful place to start. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a great exercise. Nice. So just curious now, now that we're at the end, you know, after this presentation, does, did anybody up their, their percent or is everybody staying the same? Let's see where if you could just quickly put in the chat, what percentage do you think is mental? Oh, we've got 110 this time, Jason. 110% <laughs> mental. Love it. People are paying attention. Love it. 100%. 100% uh, for Miss Danny. 110, 105, 90, 90. So obviously, um, you made your point, and that is fantastic. We've got people paying attention, and I love it. Um, that means it was very engaging. So we'd like to open it up right now. Um, I don't mind at all staying. That's okay with you, uh, Jason, because we want to be respectful of your time. And and let's okay. make sure you know we take some questions. So you can type your question, and I can call on you to unmute, or I can read it for you. Nicholas Jensen said, "Big eye opener." Thank you, Jason. Cruz, thank awesome. you so much. You made me think so much bigger now. That is a compliment. Because cool. I know that's that's your passion and your goal is to make you know others feel more alive. So, you know, when we do that just with one person, doesn't it feel great? So but good. You're doing right? that. Yeah, but you're doing that across. Yeah, the board, no questions so. are out of bounds, guys. Anything that comes up, and um, and if you're not comfortable asking. On the call, you can always um, send me a DM through Instagram or Facebook, and I'm I'm pretty good there, or my website as well. Um, I'm I'm always happy to answer questions or point you in the right direction. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I got one from Tasha about um, what advice did you give the future riders last week in New Jersey? So, um, as you guys know, Supercross is is um, such an intense sport and and so fast paced. Um, the things that I did was the exact side that I showed you guys on focus and nerves, although we didn't go through all of them. We talked about um, focus and concentration, because, again, if you lose just even a split second out there focus, then you have super really big consequences, right, about potentially crashing or just losing focus that you slide out or and and because Supercross is so fast paced, um, I thought that was probably the, one of the more impactful and the next topic we talked about was nervous and and yeah, anxiety. Um, and uh, what I loved about that is all the guys kind of actually opened up, um, or several of them did, about that they were really nervous. I asked them to raise their hand, and and more than half raised their hand saying they were uh, really nervous. And again, these are the guys that are top of their class right now and um, and also had already raced several of the, the futures I think three of them already that raised their hands and they were nervous um, the day before the race. And so just know that that's a normal response that to any competition that, that you feel that way. So, um, but that was, the, that those are the two topics that we talked about and um, yeah, great question. Yeah, that was a really great question. I was wondering the same thing and it is interesting to know that, you know, those riders are all nervous, right? How many of you think that riders just aren't nervous and that you're the only one, right? And then when you hear that, you realize, wow, I'm not alone in feeling that way. Yeah. Um, we have a question from one of our uh, ambassadors at Entrepreneur School. Aiden, can I call on you to ask your question? Or in the chat, would you prefer me to read it for you? Put you on the oh, spot, Aiden. 
Well, it wasn't a question. I was saying about, I was saying thank you for helping me realize how much potential I have inside me. So, and I also, I also wanted to ask, how did you overcome the, the accident? Like, what did you do to overcome it? Yeah. I'm not trying to make you feel bad or anything. I just, I was just wondering. Yeah, no, Aiden, great questions. Great questions. Um, um, first, thank you for your comments. And um, as far as overcoming my accident, you know what, that was, um, uh, I was 17. And um, uh, coming off motocross, it was one of the most heartbreaking times, because you can imagine all of a sudden, I was told I can't, I can't walk ever again. And I have to use a wheelchair for my mobility. And, and I don't get to fulfill my dream of becoming a professional motocross racer that was going to happen that summer. And so that was a really hard time. The thing and the way that I got over that um, was first, I, I definitely believed in myself, regardless of what the sport was, but it was really my family and friends around me that kind of propped me up. I'll tell you the thing that made the difference. And this is kind of just shows how, how strong my, my mom is and my family, my mom, after, um, after a couple of days of lying in the hospital and, and feeling bad for myself, she said, um, we're going to give you like two weeks to feel bad for yourself. And then we're going to just get on with your rehabilitation and just get out there and learn how to, how to deal with this new thing. And we really just took it one step at a time. We didn't know anything about what it meant to have to use a wheelchair. And, and, um, and what the cool part was, is um, we had known David Bailey, who had the same injury as me about three years before me. And so we reached out, my mom reached out to him, just like you guys would reach out to somebody that you looked up to. David was like a childhood hero of mine growing up being a motocross world champion, if you don't know David. And, um, and we learned, wow, that people wheelchair race and they have, they get around and their, their lives are exactly the same as they would have been, except now you have to use a wheelchair and I don't get to race. So, so that for me, um, seeing somebody else. And, and when I was in the hospital after a couple of weeks, the Boston Ma marathon was on television and I saw David on TV in a racing wheelchair. And I thought I am doing that. And so I focused my energy on what I couldn't do. I think I put this in the video onto what I could do. And that was continue to do sport. And again, it, it's not what we do. It's how we do it. Right. And so, um, although it was really hard, cause as I put in my video, I, I was a horrible wheelchair racer and I went from winning all these races in motocross to, to not being so good, but it was really my friends and family. Um, and those people around me that helped me get to the next level. And it was, is really leaning on them and all my friends, my high school bought me a, my first wheelchair. And, and so it was really that. And, and also because I had, I had had success and gone through hard things in motocross, I knew that I could that I would just approach life the same exact way. And, and again, it wasn't easy. There was times where I was really sad and then times where I was really hopeful about my future. And, and now I can't imagine it being any different, um, being able to compete all over the world and train and race with the best athletes in the world and win world championships. And, and, um, and now get to talk to you guys and, and do that and, and share how I, how I became my best and, and how you guys can become your best no matter what circumstance, no matter how good you are now at something that you know that you can always get better and believe, believe that anything is possible when you put your mind to it. Um, I had to have fun in the process, right? So thank you for your, your question, Aiden. I appreciate it. Yeah. That was a great question, Aiden. Thank you. And, and thank you, Jason, for sharing that story. Um, we got from Bentley. Bentley, do you feel comfortable asking questions? another on track ambassador i know i know you're up for this oh bentley's mic isn't working no problem so okay. bentley said i get i get frustrated sometimes do you and what do you do to overcome it yeah oh uh, that's a really good question bentley um so good um Quite honestly, I get frustrated all the time. And and um, the way in which I, I've learned now is that um, when I have these expectations of what the outcome should be before I even start the process, that's usually where I get where I get frustrated. So for me, it's it's kind of it's staying open minded to doing my best and being my best. 
And what I always say to my athletes is, how do we just control what we can control, right? We can't, what can we control? Um, we can control our effort. We can control the way in which we do things. We can control what those things are, right? What can't we control? We can't control our competitors. We can't control the weather. If it's a muddy day, we can't control that we got three hours of homework tonight, right? But we can control how we respond to it. We can respond to, if we're not good at something, how how much we strive to be better, right? So, so I focus on what I can control. And then that helps me get centered around not being as frustrated. And then there's just times where I'm just frustrated. And, and, and when I do that, um, uh, I'd love steam by go doing a few miles in my racing wheelchair and find ways to control my stress so that I don't, um, I don't let that carry on to the next day or even to another part of the day. And so when I do that, the most important thing for me is that I don't let it affect, um, affect me too long. I know that, okay, I'm not feeling good. I'm feeling in a funk right now, or I just had a bad morning or I had a bad race. And so I don't let it affect me too long. Um, hope that helps Bentley. Great question, Bentley. And Jason, I, I just really admire how genuine um, your answers are and sharing it because I think sometimes the perception of the people that we look up to in our sport is that nothing is affecting them, that they're, they're not nervous, that they're perfect, that every day is a great day. <laughs> and yeah. I just hearing you say to the audience that you're frustrated often, I, I think it, it helps us. Does everybody yeah. get that? That you know what? It's every day is is a challenge in itself and it's how you look at it and uh what you what you do on that so i really appreciate your candid responses to the to the audience thank you so much for that yeah absolutely any other questions from any of you before we sign off tonight you can use your Raise your hand emoji. You can type it in the chat. If not, then we'll start to sign off, but I'll give you another minute here. Oh, we have Brooklyn. Brooklyn, do you want to mute and, and share your story? Sure. Um, I had a really bad accident like a while back last June and it really like struggled my confidence with my horse. But after you did your presentation, I was really confident with my riding now. And I feel like more confident to get back in the ring. I've been in the ring, but I was never like as confident as I was. I would always get really nervous and get scared that she would do it again. But now I feel a lot more confident about it. So thank you. Oh, you're well, you're welcome. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. So you brought up a really good question and just point Brooklyn, because um, um, we all have accidents, right? We all have things that are really outside of our control. And um, the way I kind of look at that, because I, I felt guilty for a long time after my accident too. I'm like, wow, this is, it just is a lot. And so I know that a lot of you guys are dealing with that after accidents. Like, how do you just sort of move forward and feel, feel confident? And again, it, you're the, the one that has to look in the mirror and feel good about that um what i say is also first we is we do the inventory meaning that we we look what lessons can we learn about what happened and and can we do anything different that we would have done anything different and then once we decide that we just let that go and and really that's where the mental part of just focusing on what we can control right we can't control some of those things that are outside of our control that are going to just happen and accidents do happen it's never fun but when we we continue to, to do that, we strengthen the mental muscle and become more resilient to to be able to get through those times where we're scary. And and um, believe me, um, no matter your age, right? There's all the athletes that we watch, and again, it doesn't matter the sport. Um, we all go through those times where we're scared and we're not sure. But when it's when we we keep pushing forward to be our best that we get more confident and we overcome that those scary times. Um, and, and to know and to hold back if you're not feeling 100% confident, that's okay too. And to know that, you know what, it may take some time for that to happen and, and not beating yourself up about it. Um, know that that's completely normal and, and a good way to approach it. So 
Um, awesome uh, question and point there, Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn, thank you so much, you know, for being so brave and sharing that because I, I know it's kind of scary. It helps so many people to hear, you know, what you've gone through and, and the success that you're feeling and the fact that you're feeling more confident. So I appreciate that. We want you to fill a place and that you can raise your hand in a virtual environment and ask your question. So I appreciate that. We do have one more question here from Boris. Um, Boris would like to know what motivates you to keep going in your career? Wow, that's another really good one. Um, um, you know what? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, um, uh, it's a good question because uh, so I won the world championships, right? And and then I won it again. And I thought, wow, I'm, am I going to keep racing? And what I loved about racing was I, 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 it wasn't all the time that I'd loved the process. And so it, it took me a little bit of time to really love that process. And, um, and now what I've learned is that um, um, when I can help others, it makes me feel even better than if I do really cool stuff for myself. And so that really motivates me to want to be better. Um, for coaching and for my athletes and for them to be better. And, um, and so, yeah, that's what really kind of gets me up and out of bed in the morning early and, and going on my day. And, and, um, and so it, for you, all you guys, if you're not motivated or that, find the thing that you love to do and it won't ever feel like work. And, and um, yeah, when you focus on the process and not, not the place that you're going to get right. And that doesn't mean you don't dream but that you focus on why you love riding a bike, why you love riding a horse, why, whatever those things are. And then that's just naturally motivating. So yeah, hope that helps. Yeah. Excellent. I think one of our on track team members wants to ask a final question. Do we have time for one more? <laughs> okay. Who on the on track team there is asking a question? Hi, it's me. We're bringing some questions over. Um, first of all, I just want to say, Jason, this is amazing. Your insight and knowledge and just this conversation and questions are really cool. Um, what kind of advice would you give any of us, whether we're an athlete or just anybody that's in that kind of state of frustration and working on strengthening that muscle of our mind, when you're kind of met with feeling that pattern of just being frustrated, but you're trying to approach something different. I think a lot of us tend to, when we create a repetition of feeling a certain way about going into something, it's really hard to break that. Yeah. Yeah. Really good question. And, um, uh, it, it actually can be really simple in the sense of, um, um, I go, I'll go back to first is, is controlling what we want to control. Right. But the first thing that I do when, when I'm in that place is I get really clear on what I want. And that may be a goal or, um, but I'll even go a step further. And this is what we call a feeling goal. So I'll have a goal of like, I want to feel X, Y, or Z, or I want to just feel relaxed and chill and really enjoy the process. And so I make my focus just on that. And I find that when I focus on the thing that, and even when I was competing, I found that when I focus on helping others, when I help to focus on encouraging my other athletes, so what, so for instance, if I was nervous before the race, I would go over to my athletes or my fellow athletes and, and say, Hey, good luck tomorrow. Do you need anything? You need help with putting air in your tires? Do you need, you know, how's, how's your equipment? Is everything looking good? And so it took the pressure off me. And so I, I love that when you help others, it sort of takes the pressure off of you. And that always feels good. Um, and when I'm frustrated, um, but again, it, it comes back to getting clear on exactly what you want and then controlling what you can control. Now, the other thing is you have to write this stuff down. And so like on one side of the paper, I would say, this is what I'm feeling. This is what's frustrating me, right? On the top. And then on the one side would be, this is what I can control about what's happening. This is what I can't control. And then that just helps you kind of take inventory of, of what it actually is that's frustrating you. Because it may not even be that thing or maybe something that's totally outside your control and then you can just say like okay i can't do anything about this and then and then you move on but but what happens is you, i think the, the the person asking the question that 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 process is not so easy to do because it's hard to break a pattern 
that we just automatically go to. And that's where I come in to help, but but also your parents or friends and relying on them and um and asking for help when when that's you get awesome. stuck. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was a great question, Ellie. Thank you for bringing that over from the, the YouTube side. All right. Well, I hope that everybody really just gleaned, you know, from Jason from his his amazing story and how he's turned that into such a positive uh, influence that's, you know, spreading throughout community right here tonight and the people that that you work with Jason thank you so much for your time and again if you guys would follow Jason on his Instagram it's at Jason Fowler 13 and Facebook Jason.fowler.13 and his website jasonfowler.co um you can you to learn from Jason so Jason thank you so much for sharing your your night with us and uh this was really really exciting we had a lot of engagement in a lot of a lot of these kids just turning around right away and saying i feel better just makes my heart so happy so thank you awesome thank you guys for coming i appreciate it and all the great questions okay. and yeah have a great night everybody okay good night everybody thanks for joining <laughs>